the main idea behind this this um, you know, keeping Tai Chi weird is that a lot of the ways that we talk about Tai Chi is actually comes from kind of neo-Confucianism, right? Which, because essentially um, Taoism was kind of the, the, the religion of China. Um, Confucianism, I'm assuming you're all fairly familiar, but it's basically the idea that everything needs to be ordered, you know, there's respect for the elders so the, the, your elders can tell the, the younger people what to do, et cetera. It's a very rigid system. Um, it, it had a huge influence on China and, and um, it still actually has a huge influence today. Um, but mm -hmm. in basically the 10th, 11th century, Buddhism came into China and they essentially brought this, this kind of very powerful spiritual practice. And because of that, there was a conflict, there was a cultural conflict between Buddhism, you know, Indian culture and indigenous Chinese culture. So the Neo-Confucians essentially brought in a lot of Taoism within their practice, which is why sometimes when we talk about things like, you know, the Bagua, Yin and Yang and all that kind of stuff, it's not necessarily Taoist. It can also be Neo-Confucian, right? And so one of the things that it's done is it introduced this kind of much more rigid way of thinking about Tai Chi and thinking about energy and everything that, that happens because it's more tied to numerology. It's tied to uh, rigid systems, right? Um, Feng Shui uh, is actually a good example of that, where you basically start kind of mapping things out and saying, okay, this corner is this, and so things start to have fixed meanings. And this, that idea of fixed meaning is more tied to Neo Confucianism than to Taoism itself, because Taoism is at first a shamanic practice, right? So the the Taoism, which is not <laughs> Neo Confucian, is more rural, right? It comes from the villages. It's the actual practice. It's the the living religion of people living in the villages outside of the major cities, right? Because Chinese society itself was kind of split between the imperial systems and then the lands that were being um, controlled by the, the empire. Um, but the truth is there was very little interaction between the two systems, right? Once or twice a year, you'd have the imperial tax collector show up, take the taxes and go away. But the rest of the time, basically the people were left alone, which is why they had their own kind of Taoist practice, which in, and the, so there's all sorts of different types of Taoism. And this is one of the things that we kind of want to bring back into Tai Chi is this kind of, um, kind of chaotic <laughs> aspect to, to the practice, because, you know, so you had, you know, in terms of Taoism, you had the, you know, the hermits, the people who were off into the mountains doing meditation 12 hours a day and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you had a, a priestly, uh, it is priestly in, term, in the sense that it's a learned families who are the holders of the, uh, the text and the rituals, right? So you have a priestly, it's not a caste, it's more of a family tradition. Um, and then you have the communal rituals that were performed by all the people within the community. And the thing is, everybody's involved, right? So the entire fam the entire community builds the Taoist temple, which also becomes the central ritual, which becomes also simply the meeting place um, for everybody. And then you have the shamans. Uh, some of them are called the red hats because they wore red turbans. You know, this is the the, the head witch, the, the the witch doctors and all that. The people who were there to um, deal with demons, who were there to cure, you know, if you have an issue. So there's all of that is built in or is, is part of um, Tai Chi and, and the history of Tai Chi. So, so are you saying that when we if we're studying um, studying this kind of stuff, and we see, we run into these highly regimented uh, metaphysical systems where there's correspondence cosmology between the direction, you know, when I mean, you get the whole stems and branches type stuff, when you, yes. when you, get, in, yep. you know, get into that level, you're saying that you're just saying that that's not, that there's two different influences there, here to, to be mindful two, of. Exactly. So it's not, it's not that either one is wrong or don't exist. Because there's definitely still this, uh, this structure that is correct, right? In terms of the Bagua and how the trigrams in the Bagua relate to each other, all that is correct. So it's not that 
there that it, there's an incorrect connection between them. Um, it's the fact that we tend to have um, written treatises on this that come more from the Neo-Confucian aspect because all the stuff that comes out of the villages is not going to be written down, right? It's part of the communal um, uh, uh, rituals and way of life. So that's why there's a bias towards this kind of Neo-Confucian ideas as opposed to the kind of wilder, kind of more creative and communal aspect of, of Taoism and Tai Chi. Because, um, so Tai Chi itself, right? Tai Chi itself is actually fairly young. It didn't appear until like the 1940s, 1950s, but it's based on a long tradition. tradition. And so we know of the evolution of Tai Chi and of, of Chinese martial arts because we have these written treatises, treatises. But most of the written treatises come out of, educated elites like generals and all that kind of stuff but they were they tended to be more in, uh, involved in creating martial arts that could be taught quickly and effectively to troops right so Chris, yeah did you mean 1840s 1850s oh 18 yes 1840s <laughs> sorry yeah. 1840s um so but what comes out of the villages is the tradition of the self-defense so every village would create its own martial art. And then the young men within that were trained in that martial art so that they can defend themselves against you know, uh, thieves and all that kind of stuff. But the, the young men were also part of the religious rituals. And they were also part of the, uh, the theatrical productions that were done that were part of the rituals. So every member of the village, right, especially if all the young men were both martial artists theater performers and uh, members of the religious community, right? So that, and there's no, there's no break between, between those functions because one of the ways that um, the, the kind of martial art and ceremony and, uh, of, of kind of this rural Taoism works is that the theater you're performing is part of the process of invoking the spirits that are part of the religious ceremony, right? So there's, so, and the, a lot of the theater performances are of heroes and like, you know, um, great Taoist immortals who are fighting off um, demons because that's the goal of the, the, the raising of, of the spirits around you is to protect you from demons and, and bad influences. So you would have these young men who are trained martial artists walk on stage, perform a ritualized fight with demon as part of a religious ritual to invoke the, the heroes and the immortals and the spirits that were part of kind of the Taoist pantheon. So this is where Tai Chi itself becomes part of a, uh, a spiritual performance. All right? And I think that's the thing that we have to, to remember. And that's where you have the... Um, uh, the connection between the weird part of Tai Chi and just the practice of Tai Chi. Tai Chi comes out of this idea that by doing these moves, we're now connecting ourselves to the spirit world, right? It's a, that, and, and it, it's really important to think, to, to remember this performance, performance itself is a, an act of spiritual awakening. It's a, an act of invocation, and we have that even in the West, the tradition of, of Egypt, for, I mean, the whole theater tradition in the West evolved out of religious rituals, right? Reenactment of the lives of the gods. So there's always been this idea that by performing something, you are now echoing a god or a divine spirit. And by doing that, you're drawing them in, right? You're drawing in their attention by essentially mimicking them. So that's the idea that we want to keep in mind, right? The movement that we do echoes something which is greater, which is outside of us, right? Um, the, there's a great example in actually in these kind of Taoist rural um, uh, uh, rituals that um, they would do puppet shows, right? And but they would there would be one guy doing the puppet show, but he would do he would do it all by himself in an empty room because it, it was thought that it was so powerful, like these puppets reenacting these spirits, that the spirits would come and inhabit the puppets themselves. 
And so it was so potent that nobody should be able to, to see it because otherwise it would cause kind of spiritual damage. But that's the kind of thing we're talking about, like invoking spirits into physical objects, into people also. There was a lot of, um, a lot of children especially would become possessed by the spirits during these performances. So we're talking about like a direct um, process. It's, a, a, it's not a, um, uh, as far as they were concerned, this is, it, this is not like trivial. This is we're performing, we're doing these theatrical performances in order to bring the spirits down. And then one of the things that would happen is that the children would be, would be possessed and then they would talk to the spirits and all that kind of stuff. Right. So it's, it's, uh, it's not a small thing. Um, the, and again, everybody is involved and there's no separation between martial art performance and, and uh, spiritual, uh, spiritual um, contact.